Where are we going in this world of woe? So much suffering and misery. Our hearts are longing for the endless home of peace and love and harmony. No more bitterness, hatred or greed. Paradise is the place we need. I feel the peace inside of me. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues, where we discuss the issues of common interest to the three Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Today I'm going to be talking about the subject of where is the Christ in Christianity. Now that title might strike people as a little unusual if they have not been introduced to the concept before. The reason for the title, Where is the Christ in Christianity, is simply that many who read the Christian scriptures encounter a paradox that they have difficulty resolving. And that paradox is that the teachings of Jesus Christ often are found to be seemingly at odds with the tenets of Christian faith. Now, I would like to begin by backing up a step to the Old Testament. We all know, of course, Christianity is based upon the New Testament. But let's back up for a minute to the Old Testament. The scripture that Jesus Christ held up as the scripture of his time. We have to remember that Jesus Christ was an Orthodox Jew. This is why he is frequently referred to as Rabbi Jesus. The Old Testament was the book that Rabbi Jesus held up as the book of laws of his time. These were the laws that he taught to his disciples. And so it is important for us to take a speculative look at the Old Testament. Let's begin with Genesis 32, where it is recorded that Jacob wrestled with another man. No. Uh, an angel? No, although it might say that in the translation. No, it's actually written that Jacob wrestled with God. Now, modern translations have tried to pretty much make this difficulty go away. They translate it as man or angel, but we have to read the scriptures in the foundational language in which they were recorded. And when we do this, we find that the Old Testament records that Jacob wrestled with God. Now, Let's put this into perspective. Our universe is vast. How vast exactly is it? Well, take 240, add 21 zeros after it, and that's how many miles the universe is in diameter. 240 with 21 zeros after it is seven sets of three zeros with commas. It's a number so vast, I'm not even sure if anybody knows the name for it. And on top of that, within this known universe, we have over a billion galaxies, and the universe, despite its vastness, is still expanding at 90% the speed of light. Now, this is creation of our creator, and we are to believe that Jacob, a man, wrestled with the creator of this vast universe not only wrestled with him, but as the Bible records, prevailed. It records that Jacob prevailed in wrestling against God. Now, as I said, modern translations have tried to escape from this difficulty by translating that Jacob wrestled with an angel or wrestled with a man. That's not what the foundational scripture says. And we have to look at the foundational scripture if we are going to get a true feel for the accuracy of these writings. Now, unreliability is a recurring problem in the Old Testament. One of the largest examples of unreliability 
is to be found in 2 Samuel 24, 1, compared with 1 Chronicles 21, 1. In 2 Samuel 24, 1, it reads, quote, Again the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Fair enough. What did it say? The anger of the Lord. And he moved to David. What does 1 Chronicles 21.1 say? Quote, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Here we have two passages describing the same historical event in very clear, unequivocal language. One speaks of God, the other speaks of Satan. Now, we have to ask ourselves at this point, is there any possible way to rectify this? In another passage, as I told you, Genesis 32, 24 through 30, it records a man, Jacob, as having wrestled with God. Here we find two passages, one speaking of God, one speaking of Satan, describing the same historical event. In both of these passages, there is no possible way to rectify this inconsistency. So, which was it? Was it the Lord? Or was it Satan? We don't know. But what we do know is that it renders the Old Testament unreliable as a book of Scripture. As God is all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect, and all-reliable, he does not make the simplest of mistakes. A human being might. And we have to assume, okay, maybe this mistake came from a scribe. But if the revelation has been passed down to us in this time, with these errors existing within the text, and we cannot trust that portion, then what portion can we trust? Now, Christians would like to believe that the New Testament is free from such errors. Christians would like to say, well, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's Old Testament. Let's not worry about that. We have the New Testament. We don't base our faith upon the Old Testament. That's of historical significance because the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. Well, it's a fair enough argument if it bears water. And in order to analyze that, we have to look at the New Testament and consider whether or not there are similar inconsistencies. So let's do that. To begin with, where Jesus and his family allegedly fled when they were persecuted, one gospel, Matthew, records the family having fled. Another, Luke, records the exact same scenario. One records the family having fled to Nazareth. The other records the family having fled to Egypt. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Luke 11, 2 through 4. They differ over the wording of the Lord's Prayer. Now, think about what this means. We're talking about the Lord's Prayer. We're not talking about a little esoteric little known uh, prayer. We're talking about the Lord's Prayer, the most commonly quoted Christian prayer in the world throughout the history of Christianity. And yet we have two different versions of it. It is described in two Gospels, and the wording does not agree. How much does the wording not agree? Over the last several years, the Jesus Seminar has compiled over 300 fellows of the Jesus Seminar. These are leading Christian scholars who represent their various faiths. They are at the top of the academic and the theological field, and they analyze the Christian scriptures. They analyze the foundational manuscripts, not the ones that we read in our translations into whatever language. No, they analyze the manuscripts in their original language. How big is the difference between the two versions of the Lord's Prayer? It is so large that the Jesus Seminar agrees that the only word Jesus Christ reportedly stated 
that they can agree upon that he stated was Father. Now we're talking about the prayer that starts, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed with the name, da 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 da. But as famous as this prayer is, as much as people rely upon this prayer and think that these were the actual words of Jesus, the preeminent theologians and Christian scholars of the Jesus Seminar have concluded that the only word of the Lord's Prayer that can be definitively traced to Jesus Christ is the word Father. So this gives us some idea of the problems that exist in the New Testament as well. Matthew and John disagree over another point of critical importance. In Matthew 11, 13 through 14, and uh, chapter 17, 11 through 13, uh, and John 1, 21. These two Gospels disagree over whether John the Baptist was Elijah or not. In one case, John the Baptist described as Elijah. In another case, he is disavowed as Elijah. Again, you can't have it both ways. And in a book of God, we don't expect to find this kind of discrepancy. Now, that's enough information for all of us to chew on for a few minutes. So let's take a break, and we'll come back shortly.